Hi there, Lindsay here, the Frugal Crafter, and it's time for another Ask a Crafter. I got my laptop here because I forgot to close down the last comments thread and I had a few more questions pop in and I wanted to answer them because they were really good ones. And, um, and yeah, I didn't want anyone to be left out. So the first question comes from Bird Lady and she has a question about cleanup. She wants to know how to make the crafting process as clean as possible. And my advice is to actually make sure your workspace is set up so it's easier to clean and not easy to access everything. So that's a Marie Kondo tip, but I found it to be very useful. So generally my table, now I've been uh, I've been filming, so I do have some stuff out, but I'm just gonna zoom this around. My table is pretty much cleared off and I've got a cutting mat in the middle and I have a black cutting mat there. That's the cutting side. So I usually work on that surface. I can spray it down, wipe it off. Stains don't really show and I can cut on that. Now, if I'm gonna use something like colored pencils where I need the surface to be smooth behind me, then I just flip it over at the back side of that cutting mat is gray. It's lighter in tone. It's great for using for colored pencils. So just make your work surface easy to clean. Uh, rather than easy to access. I don't like to have all my stuff out on my table. Like I have my marker racks over here. Um, I don't like to have all my stuff on the table all the time because then you've got to clean around it. You got to dust it. And if you spatter paint, you're going to spatter on it and stuff. Another thing that would be handy if you're real messy is to use a silicone mat. This is the waffle flower media mat. You can also get inexpensive Teflon mats uh, that are meant for like oven lining, like to put at the bottom of your oven to catch drips and stuff like that. You can get like a three pack of like a pretty big sheet for I think are under $10 on Amazon. They're like the Ranger mats. You can lay that down, work on that and wipe it up when you're done. Um, you could also put newspaper down and throw the newspaper away when you're done, but I just spray it with water and wipe it off. That works really well for me, even with messy stuff like brush -o. Um, Maria Deasy asks, can you explain granulating waters versus non-granulating watercolors? And uh, yes, granulating watercolor is generally a mineral-based pigment. So uh, your watercolor pigments actually could be mineral-based pigments or they can be organic or synthetic dyes. Dye-based pigments are uh, more staining. They're made of tinier particles and they're usually your more vibrant colors. They will actually seep into the watercolor paper and make it difficult to scrub out, so they stain. So your vivid colors generally will stain and they will um, seep into the paper a bit. Now your granulating granulating colors generally come from minerals uh, such as iron oxide. They may also come from stones. Um, your, my most granulating colors, I would think ultramarine blue. That's uh, both the synthetic ultramarine blue and the natural lapis lazuli ultramarine blue. A very bright granulating blue. Very easy to scrub and lift off your paper. So the reason you might want to use a granulating color versus a non-granulating color is that you can lift it back. You can get back to the white of the paper very easily. They also leave a pretty texture and pattern on your paper when you mix it up, especially with a lot of water, and you let it dry naturally, you'll see little specks and texture in your wash. You can also see that in kind of cheaper paints with lots of fillers as well, but um, granulating color basically means that you've got big chunks of pigment particles and they sit in the water on top of your paper. They don't sink into your paper and they kind of... Um, Oh, they kind of chunk up and leave textures and patterns as they dry. You'll get the best effect with granulating colors on uh, in wet washes on a smoother paper because there's nothing to um, uh, to kind of trap little pigment particles. They can kind of settle out how they want to. And Daniel Smith has a wonderful selection of granulating colors. If you are looking for something like that, they even have granulating colors that are mixes. So they will split out into two different colors, which is kind of pretty. Like if you mix a gray with burnt umber or burnt sienna and ultramarine blue, um, they'll mix up to a nice gray. But if you have a really wet wash, as they dry, you'll see the colors kind of split apart in places and it's really just kind of pretty. So that's the difference between granulating and non-granulating colors. Uh, hopefully that made sense. Eager Crafter asks, I would like to know the difference between watercolor and gouache. Also, what's the difference with brushes? What sizes are good and what types are good for what? It's so confusing. Well, watercolor and gouache essentially are both water soluble paints. Gouache is simply an opaque watercolor. Now they're gonna behave differently because adding all that white to the watercolor or the heavier pigment particles that make gouache opaque, like it might not be just white added, it could, it's also how they mill the pigments differently. So they'll be more, um, so they'll sit on top of the paper like our granulating watercolors. They're gonna sit on top of the paper and not sink in. They lift easier and they're more thick. You don't wanna apply them really thick because they could flake off the paper but they have more body to them. So yes, you can take your watercolors, add white and make um, opaque watercolors, which is what gouache is, but when you buy gouache paint, you're generally getting a more vibrant color that could just 
they could be both having some opacifiers added to them, but also treating the pigments differently so they're not so transparent, they're not as finely ground. Um, for gouache, you're generally not adding as much water as you do with watercolor, so using a brush like a golden Taclon that's a little bit firmer is going to work a lot better. For gouache, I personally like to use filberts the most. They are um, oh, I've got some back here. I can just pull out and show you. These are what I generally use for gouache. They are uh, Menta. I like the um, I like the Zen All Media and the Menta All Media brushes. They are by Royal Nine Nickel. They're very affordable. I choose ones that are. Um, I'm going to try to find a filbert here to show you. I like ones that are filberts, so they've got a flat ferrule, but the tips are rounded, so they have enough stiffness to push the paint around, but they've got that rounded tip that gives you a softer look so you don't have so many harsh lines. Um, I would actually get a Zen makes, Zen, I don't know if Menta does, but Royal Aqualon and Royal and Line Nickel Zen brushes, they have a set of brushes that it's all filberts. It's like 10 filberts of different sizes. I would get that. I think that would, um, you know, they would go from like, that to that. AC Moore used to sell them, um, so probably the other big box stores do too. They're great for gouache. I really, that's my favorite brush for, for gouache. For watercolor though, you want something that's got like softer, floppier bristles because um, like this is a, this is a sword, but um, you want something with softer, floppier, more absorbent bristles generally because you want to carry a lot of water and pigment to be able to cover an area. So you, that water is going to do a lot of the work in watercolor, so you want softer brushes for that. Uh, you can use your watercolor and gouache brushes interchangeably if you want to. It's not going to hurt the brush, but you don't want to be trying to push around uh, thicker passages of, passages of paint with a really soft brush like this. It's just going to be frustrating and it's not great for the brush. So I would have a handful of Taclon brushes for my gouache. You can use those gouache brushes with your watercolor. And I would have some soft brushes for watercolor that just hold a lot of paint that you're not necessarily going to use with gouache. But grabbing any of those gouache brushes to do a detail in your watercolor painting would be absolutely fine. You also might want to have a few fine tipped rounds like this for your gouache, just for getting those fine lines. And I would go for like little, uh, like a, a size zero or size one round or spotter brush for that, for doing those little highlights, eyelashes, things like that um, in your gouache. And of course, you can grab those for details in your watercolor if you want to as well. But the watercolor brush is generally softer, more absorbent, and gouache a little firmer. I don't like hog brushes for gouache. Some people do. A hog brush are those like wiry white bristles. Um, I feel like they just kind of scrape too much paint off. Uh, so Golden Taclon is a great bet for those. And um, I've got a kind of related question from Michelle Make It Up. She says, what are three watercolor brands that you would suggest for a beginner? Um, three for an intermediate and three for a professional. Okay, so she also asks on Nina Classic Crest Solar White Paper, which side is the right side for alcohol markers? You can use either side. Um, so yeah, either side for the Nina. And uh, for the watercolor brands, let's see, for a beginner, I would say pretty excellent by me by uh, by Paul Rubens Mi Lang that that would be my and I'll try to remember to link that up so pretty excellent that's 36 colors for 20 bucks I would also recommend if you want tube colors Van Gogh by Royal Talons and um, I would also recommend Cotman because they're so easy to find the Windsor Newton Cotmans all over the world so I would say those three you probably won't be able to find all of them wherever you are so pick one you know, I think the pretty excellent will probably be the best bang for your buck, but you might not have it in your country, but you probably could find one of the other two, no matter where you are in the world. Uh, intermediate. Um, let's see. I would say White Knights would be number one. Um, or that's also, they also sell that under the trade name of Yarka St. Petersburg, but it's cheaper if it's White Knights. They are a nice professional, <clears throat> less expensive range. Um, the Renaissance out of Poland. Also, artist quality, but a l not quite as high artist quality as some other brands, but a good value. Um, and Magello, Mission Gold, if you can find the good deal, like they have the set on Amazon, it's $55 for 36 colors. That's a, that's, I'm like, that's, I have to restrain myself not to buy that just to have it as backup. But yeah, those would be the three for intermediate. And uh, for professional, gosh, that's, that's really personal choice because there's so many wonderful professional brands out there, but I would probably say, um, M. Graham, Daniel Smith, or Da Vinci, and those are all American brands. Um, there are other equivalent 
professional brands, those just popped to mind as far as like value and quality. But I'm also in America, so those might be way more expensive where you live. So look at look at what you have locally, what's being produced near your country, near your home country, and you're probably going to get the best value by buying something close. Like if you live in Germany, uh, Schmink is going to be a much better value. It's gonna it's a high quality watercolor. It's just so expensive here that I don't even really think of it that often because it's so expensive. So um, definitely shop local when you're looking at professional art supplies because the difference could be half. You could pay 50% for a locally made watercolor pastel oil paint versus um, one from another continent just because import taxes and all of that. Um, you'll definitely just just get it any name brand, any name brand, their professional line is gonna is gonna be good. But um, but there you go. And um, this is the last one for this video and it's from Beth C and she says, how do you know if your stamps are free to use in your art? So rubber stamps. Um, so what you can do is look up, so you buy a stamp or maybe you're thinking about buying a stamp, you look what company makes it and you go to their website and you search angel policy or, or you can even search like Stampendous angel policy and it will it'll list out what you can do with the stamps. Most companies will allow you to sell cards made with their stamps. Some will require you to purchase a copyright stamp, like images copyright by, like Stampin' Up is big on that. They want you to stamp the back of the stamps with a big Stampin' Up copyright uh, stamp. But most don't care. Most will let you, as long as you hand stamp it, and you're making less than like a thousand of the same design, then you're fine to use it and sell your stuff at craft fairs or on Etsy or whatever. Um, there's usually um, there's usually an exclusion for licensed work. So like, let's say you bought a rubber stamp that had like Tinkerbell on it and you wanted to make some, some things to sell. Generally, you wouldn't be able to make those to sell, but like you can make them and mail them to your friends. You can make them use them for a party. Um, you know, you can use it for personal use. That means you're not selling the image. Uh, you're not selling the um, the product that you're making. So anything like John Deere, Disney, uh, sports teams, any of those you're probably not going to be able to sell. But if it's like they're general in-house designers, most companies will allow you to make and sell very generously. But you can check that out at any company's website. We'll generally have the angel policy on it. And if it doesn't, <clears throat> then you can email them. If it's a company that requires you to get permission every time you want to use it, I probably wouldn't purchase from them personally. But that's up to you. Just know what your what the company's policy is before buying and then you won't be in trouble. I have honestly, in my 20 years of stamping, never found anybody get in trouble for making and selling handmade cards, especially if they're doing their best, they're part, trying to be honest. I mean, people know you're going to you're gonna use those stamps to make cards to sell. You just, um, you know, especially if you're selling online, it, it's good to double check. Just make sure. So, you know, because sometimes what I have seen before, though, I've been stamp shows. I love stamp shows. But sometimes you see some stuff that's a little shady. Um, like I saw one stamp company. They make beautiful stamps. They had a couple sets at the stamp show that weren't available on their website, and they were like... Wizard of Oz images, like from the movies, like photorealistic stamps, and Elvis, and um, other like famous copyrighted movie clips. And um, I'm like, yeah, if I use that on a card to sell, I could get in trouble for that because they don't have the rights to use those images. So that's where you do want to be a little careful um, because if the stamp company doesn't have a right to use the image that they're selling, then it could come back on you. I really think that it would just be like, take that down, don't sell it anymore, you don't have permission to, and they would go after the stamp company, but still, I'm a little um, I'm a little cautious when it comes to issues of copyright, personally, but I've never seen anybody get in trouble for, you know, honestly just trying to sell a card. But that's how you can check, anyway. That's it for this episode of Ask a Crafter. Thank you so much for watching. Please give me a thumbs up if you enjoyed this series. And until next time, happy crafting. Bye.